All right, so this is gonna be a mega q and I've got a lot of questions here. I'm gonna jump right into it. There's some street construction going on, so I'm filming from my bedroom here. Hopefully it won't get too noisy. Anyway, all right, getting right into it. Number one, how long do you let your underpainting dry before coming in with color and thicker paint? Uh, so you guys know that typically my underpainting isn't a traditional underpainting. I will just kind of sketch out uh, things in burnt sienna, which I just thin with odorless mineral spirits. And so it's not really uh, an underpainting as it is just like a sketch to map out the big shapes. And I don't wait at all. Like as soon as I've got the sketch, I come in uh, and start blocking in my darks. So yeah, I don't wait at all. Uh, let's see, number two. Could you speak about the concept of artists uh, being able to destroy their work? Um, I do remember hearing about artists that had like a party where they'd take some of their failed paintings and, you know, either like, you know, <laughs> break them up or cut them up or light them on fire. I have not done that. Um, I think for some artists I've heard that it can be sort of cathartic or there's like uh, something about that process that they find satisfying. I don't ever do that. I've never, I don't like really feel bad about the paintings that have failed. I've talked about this on the channel here. Oftentimes, like I'm glad to have those paintings now because I can look back on them and try to problem solve and say, okay, what went wrong here? <clears throat> so I use my failed paintings as um, opportunities to grow. Um, but if it works for you to destroy them, that's cool. But I've not destroyed any of my paintings. I've painted over some that were just like bland or whatever. Um, just so that I had, you know, uh, like especially if I was running short on panels, not so much on canvas, on panels I will, I'll give it a little quick sanding and then I'll paint over it, especially if I'm going to do some sort of experimentation or exploration, um, you know, uh, then I'll paint over an old painting. Uh, and I know some people are going to ask, isn't that distracting? It can be, um, but I'll just block in all the colors really quickly to blot out the old image and then I work from there. So. Um, and oftentimes you get a really nice result because you'll get little pops of color from the, uh, from the original painting that I think can complement, uh, you know, the finish, the new painting. All right. Number three, where can I buy your paintings? Uh, you can go to studiogallerysf.com. Actually, I've got four paintings in a show right now that just opened up and it's a cityscape landscape show on four paintings in there. Uh, I will link, um, a studio galleries website down below. Uh, but also too, you can get my work on Instagram. Typically what I do is when I do a painting, I'll post it on Instagram and then people will just DM me and say, is this available, how much or whatever. And then I'll give them the price. And the way it works is that if they, you know, if they want to purchase the piece, then I will send them a PayPal invoice. They pay, pay via um, PayPal. And then I will ship the painting off via United States uh, <laughs> post office um, priority mail. So that's typically how that works. Unless it's going international, then I'll use UPS or FedEx, whichever is cheaper. All right, uh, number four, what's with all the dry paint on your palette? Um, I don't have my palette in here, but you know, there's on my palette right along where all my colors are, there is like some dried paint on there. And I know a lot of people for some reason have been triggered about that. If you're a working painter, Look at a working painter. Like if you're painting every day, I'm just squeezing out, constantly squeezing out new blobs of paint into those areas. And uh, so some of it will dry and whatever. That's just part of the process. It's like, I don't know, maybe there are painters that will clean up their whole palette every time. To me, like all the splatters and all the paint on there, I love that. To me, that's the history of a lot of work, of, of years of work. Um, now I will occasionally like say maybe once a month, if there's some dried paint, like if I miss a painting day for like say several days, I will go on there and I'll clean off that paint. So occasionally I will scrape everything down, but there's still leftover dried paint, uh, up along where I keep my colors. And uh, like I said, I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, you know, so that's just part of the process for me. Uh, I like to paint. I'm not... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not so great about the cleaning up part um, and it's just going to get messy again anyway. So whatever. All right. Uh, can you talk about uh, shooting photo references 
like what kind of cameras do you use? Are you concerned with the quality, et cetera? And then post-production. All right, so my process for photos, like I don't paint from photos, like I haven't been shooting new photos recently, but what I used to do, especially when I'd shoot for cityscape paintings, I have a Canon T2i, which is an old DSLR camera. Um, and what I like about that is I like that it's got a viewfinder. I do find it more challenging to shoot reference photos off of a phone or a camera that just has like a, a screen, whatever you call those screens. Um, I don't, it's not as inspiring for me and sometimes outdoors it's hard to, it's hard to see the screen and everything. There's something about looking through a traditional viewfinder with a like a DSLR type camera that I find more satisfying. And I just use the kit lenses that came with it. I think I have one zoom lens and I don't know the, you know, I don't know the millimeters on it, but a zoom lens I think is really helpful because you can zoom in on things and get a view of, uh, like you can compose in a way that I don't think you normally would be able to, especially like if I'm looking in the city, down a city street or something, to zoom in and get a close view of the street from a distance, but zoomed can make for really cool compositions. Um, the only thing is it's kind of heavy to carry around. Um, so that's kind of my favorite way to shoot. But to be honest with you, I'm not super concerned about quality. Um, I used to carry around a little Canon Elf that was, you know, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and the quality on it wasn't that great. And I got a lot of really good paintings out of it. I've said this before, if you go out and you plein air paint, um, you're going to know things to do to, uh, to, you know, you'll know how to work with a photograph. I mean, even a photograph on a good camera, the shadows typically are going to be darker and you're going to lose a lot of color in the photographs, like all, a lot of subtle color. So it's almost like a lot of what I'm doing is I'm just using the photograph as a starting point And then I'm using my knowledge from experience to build out the painting. Um, so... I've worked with really limited, you know, like really grainy photographs. Another thing I'll do sometimes is like, I'll have a photograph and I'll find a little spot where it's like, oh, that's really cool over here. And I'll zoom in on it. So it ends up being really grainy and not good quality. Again, I can still get a good painting out of that as well. So I'm not so concerned with the quality of the camera. It's nice that we have phones in our pocket because I think in my everyday life, um, I used to carry, before I had a phone, I'd carry around a little camera, the little elf I was talking about. And um, when I was like working and I used to do construction and stuff, and oftentimes I'd be driving to areas that I wasn't familiar with, and I would see um, things that popped out to me at me and I would take pictures of things like, and, and so, and then I just put them in an album on my computer and I had a bunch of reference photos to work with if it was like, if I couldn't get out and paint outdoors. Uh, and then they also wondered um, about the camera that I shoot with my video, and that's a, a Canon G7X. Um, and it's about $700, but it's a, it's a point and shoot, very compact. And occasionally I will shoot reference photos when I'm on scene, but not too often. I'll use my iPhone for that. But again, like I said, when I do plan, when I'm plein air painting, I rarely shoot photographs that I'm going to paint from later. Um, I just don't do that. I don't. Yeah, I don't do that very often. What I will do is when I shoot video for my YouTube videos, I will oftentimes take segments like, and I'll, I'll do a screenshot of a video, like I'll scrub through the video and find a spot where the waves are just right or the light is just right, whatever. And then I'll do a screenshot of that and work from that. So that's something I do more often now um, is just work from stills from a video clip. Okay, that was a long answer, but Anyway, there's a lot of info there. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and then post-production, there was more. Um, do I do anything to the photographs? I experiment with cropping. Um, I do that and uh, just like I'll crop square, I'll crop four by five, which would be like an eight by 10 or 11 by 14 or 16 by 20, etc. So I crop in various different ways and experiment with the photograph that way until something sort of clicks and I'm like, oh, that's cool. I could. There's a certain excitement where it's like, oh, I could paint that or I want to paint that. Uh, occasionally during the painting process, if the shadows are super dark, I will, you know, I'll crank up the exposure just while I'm painting in the shadows because uh, that'll blow out all the lights. But I bl I'll, I'll look and so I can see what colors are in the shadows. Um, so that's the only post-production I do, but not much really. 
Um, the cropping is the big thing. Getting that composition is the big thing. Um, that leads to another question, which I don't know. It's going to be out of cr uh, question, but somebody are out of order here. It doesn't matter. Uh, somebody asks, um, how do I choose the size of panel, the size of panel and the shape of panel? Again, the shape of panel is determined by whatever composition I feel works. Uh, oftentimes a square will accentuate the features in the scene that I'm, you know, it, it's the best for the composition. Sometimes, you know, like a panorama will work. It just depends, um, you know, on what works for the scene or what feels inspiring to me in the scene. Um, as far as, uh, what was the other question? Oh, as far as the size of the panel. Uh, a lot of times it's, if I have certain areas that are detailed, uh, then I want the panel to be larger so that I can get brush strokes in there. So basically, if it's a complicated scene, like I recently did a scene up in Point Reyes where there was a house or like a boat, uh, what do you call it, like a boat house over the water and a boat in the foreground. Um, you know, when I looked at that painting, I thought, okay, there's some technical stuff going on in the building and in the boat in the foreground. I want to make sure that I have enough room to kind of explore the little shapes that are in there and not feel cramped or whatever. Oftentimes, if you choose a panel that's too small, you'll get frustrated and you'll constantly be fixing the little shapes and it ends up taking longer than a big, than a big panel would take. Uh, so oftentimes, that's the deciding factor. If there's really strong, simple shapes, uh, oftentimes a small panel can be really powerful. Like if you're doing a fruit still life, it's very simple, like some orange slices or avocados. You've got a, you know very few simple, strong shapes, um, and uh, a small panel can be can work really well. Like I've some of these little fruit still lifes I've done are eight by eights, but you can have it 20 feet across the room, and the thing still pops off the wall. So. Um, so anyway, those are some deciding factors as far as the size goes. All right, next question. Where did you get the little canvas bag that holds your brushes? Uh, on the side of my, pa um, on my palette, I, I clip with a binder clip, I clip a little canvas bag. Um, you guys have probably seen it in the videos. Um, that canvas bag is like almost, yeah, it's like old, 15 years old maybe. Um, I make almost all of my painting tools and I just felt like I used to just sit my, you know, my, I'd let rest my paint, uh, my brushes on my palette or on my, not on my palette, but I would rest them on my French easel, like around the corner, like on the back of the French easel. And I just thought, you know what, it's too hard to reach around. So I made a bag and then that's what I used. So it's, it was just canvas, medium texture canvas that I had. And I got a sewing machine and sewed it and the thing has lasted um, all this time. I actually have a backup too, and so if this one ever wears out, which I don't think it will, uh, but that's where that came from. Uh, let's see here. Do you try to stay true to the colors that you see? I do. I use the colors that I see as a starting point, but then I will push colors, um, especially like in the shadows. I will push. Um, in the shadows, I'm looking for the you know a cool, warm relationship. So sometimes I will push the yellows that I see in the shadow. Typically, the shadows are going to be cool, um, and then I will add you know I'll look for yellows in there and kind of exaggerate those. Like you'll notice on the eaves of a house, um, a lot of times you get that reflected light off the ground that bounces up. So reflected light, oftentimes I will exaggerate but I don't change the colors. Um, I've done that, I do remember doing that maybe a couple times doing cityscapes where the buildings are, there's like just sort of a garish mixture of colors that I feel is unsettling. And then I will kind of calm those colors down or even flat out change the color of a building if I don't like it. Now I'll stay true to the, the values of the color, but I will change it. But oftentimes, no, I just work with what I see. I think oftentimes the colors that I see are part of what inspires me to paint something. So I do, I, like I said, I stay true to them and I just kind of exaggerate or push them when I feel, nece when, when I feel it's necessary. Does odorless mineral sp uh, spirits bother you in the studio? I used to use terpenoid and like I'd find like after a four hour session with terpenoid, I would kind of start feeling like tingly and stuff. 
Uh, with Gamsol odorless mineral spirits, I will put a fan on and I'll have an overhead fan, but I never feel any ill effects from odorless mineral spirits. Um, medium, yes. I mean, not like a linseed stand oil medium, but uh, certainly something like uh, Liquin. I never use that indoors, only minimally like to sign paintings and stuff. That's it. But yeah, odorless mineral spirits, haven't had a problem with it. Uh, what's the best time of day for plein air? Plein air, I think, is best when the shadows are strongest. Unless, of course, you're painting on a foggy day, then it doesn't matter. You can paint all day. Um, but I do prefer to paint on sunny days. And I'm looking for uh, good, strong shadow shapes, which you're going to get mostly in the morning and then in the evening, especially in the summer months. In the winter months, uh, oftentimes, like when the sun is far south, you're going to get good shadows all day long. So winter time can be uh, a good time to paint. So I'd say the key there is... You know, what time is a good time for plein air? Whenever the shadows are at their best. Um, because I like to fill my paintings with a feeling of light. And in order to have that light, you need good, strong shadow shapes. Um, the shadows are what really helps create the feeling of light. Uh, okay, is it difficult to tell... Oh, is it difficult to sell a painting that turned out really well? Um... Yes, I, I used to sell everything. Now I've kind of started holding on. There's certain paintings where I'm like, where I feel like, uh, like I don't want to part with it. So I'm, I'm keeping some work now. Uh, and then what I find is if I hang on to it, and especially if I hang it on the walls and I live with it for a while, then it goes into my permanent collection. Like I'm not going to sell it. Um, but I used to just sell everything, especially when I, in the beginning, you know, I had to sell my best work to start building up um, you know, to be able to show in galleries or sell or whatever, you got to, I had to put out my best work. Now I'm sort of, uh, that my work is getting more consistent and everything. The really good ones often I'll like say, Oh, I want to hang on to that. Another reason I'll hang on to it is because oftentimes you'll make a breakthrough and I want to hang on to it so that I can study it and, um, really, uh, you know, set into my consciousness what it is I'm doing. Oftentimes you get, you're in the process, you know, you, you, something happens that's kind of magical and you're like, wow, what happened? Okay, I need to study this painting and, and really learn what I did and make sure that I can try to incorporate that into my, you know, my painting process. Is it still viable to sell online? Do you think it's a good place to start selling? Uh, yeah, actually, I think it's the best place to start selling. You should start selling your work and have experience selling your work before you approach a gallery. Um, and selling online, I think, is good. Uh, most of my sales, like my direct sales, are now through Instagram. Get a good, clean presentation on your Instagram. Make it clear that you're serious as a painter. I mean, if you've got a personal Instagram, that's cool. You may want to start another one, an art Instagram. Keep it very art-focused. I know I put surfing clips on there occasionally, but that's it, you know? I mean, if you want to put a few selfies, too, so people see who you are, that's great. Maybe some pictures of you plein air painting. But I think Instagram uh, is a great way to reach people, and especially with smaller paintings. Start off with smaller paintings because people are, are more likely to take a chance on buying a smaller painting. Once they bought one, they're more likely to come by, back and buy a bigger piece. But um, yeah, I think it's really viable. I think, um, you know, posting a bunch of small, like your best work too, really, especially in the beginning, be critical and say, and you know, don't just post everything. Post your Post work where you're like, oh, this is what I want to be doing. This, I'm really proud of this. I'd hang this on my wall or I'd buy this painting. Um, be very critical about it. Try to build up a good uh, Instagram feed and you will start getting people requesting, you know, uh, you know, information on purchasing. So yeah, I'd say it's, I'd say it's the best way. And then once you've done some sales like via Instagram or whatever, uh, that's going to give you confidence to approach galleries because you know you sell. You know there's a demand for your work and that people like it. Okay. <clears throat> I'm trying to speed up here so my camera doesn't die. We've only got like 20 minutes. All right. Why? Uh, okay. Why do you start with your darks? Uh, I like to establish a feeling of light in my paintings like right off the bat. So I start with the darks. That's my mixture of lizard crimson and ultramarine. And I just, that's my go-to. And I just lay in all the darks. I have a feeling of light in the painting, and then I, all the decisions I make uh, subsequently as I'm laying on the paint, I'm keeping an eye on, like, am I maintaining that feeling of light, you know? So that's kind of why I start. That's why I start with darks. 
Uh, this is the next question about it. Do you always use a Lizarin Crimson Ultramarine mix for your shadows when the light is warm? I kind of use that mixture of Ultramarine and Alizarin Crimson like all the time, regardless of what color the light is. Um, and I like that it's a dark that's transparent. When it's really dark, it's almost hard to tell uh, when that mixture, when I make it dark and it's balanced between the Ultramarine and the Alizarin, it's kind of even hard to see what color it is. It just works as an effective dark. And because it's slightly transparent, I feel like it has more depth than if I were to use, say, black or something like that. So that is my dark color. Um, and I always use that. Now, this leads to the next question by the same um, person. Do you ever include local color? Yes, I do. The mixture that I start with is just a starting point to establish a light and shadow pattern. And then I come in afterwards and start looking for specific colors in there. Um, and those darks that I lay in are, like I said, transparent in there. It's a thin, you know, it's a wash. Or not a wash, but the paint has been thin, so it's a thin application. Then I can come over and start applying more accurate colors, oftentimes lightening up the shadows quite a bit. So that is the scoop. I think we got through all of them here. Uh, anyway... So it's been a pleasure. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below and uh, stay creative. I'll see you guys in the next video. Hey.